But one thing about me is that if it's a Sunday, if it's a Sunday, usually between the hours of 1 p.m. and 8 p.m., my mind and heart and soul and spirit is on one thing. Like, like especially in fall, from about September to February. If it's Sunday between 1 p.m. and 8 p.m., my mind, heart, soul, body, everything you could think of is only thinking about one thing. It's who are the Panthers playing, when are they playing, when's the rest of the division playing, like my whole entire, I could be anywhere, right? I could be at church, I could be at an event, I could be at a restaurant, I could be in the car. Like I know the second it's one o'clock, kickoff is about to happen, and I gotta know like who are the Panthers playing, what's the score, what's the down, what's the distance, I gotta know everything there is. Like I'm the type of guy, like if it's a, a perfect Sunday, I'm the type of guy, like I wanna sit right in front of the, the, the TV have absolutely no distractions. I want to hear every single word from the commentators. I want to I want to see every play, every second, every snap. Like I, I'm invested into the Panther game. Like I want to see everything. That's a, a perfect Sunday. Now every Sunday is not a perfect Sunday where I can make it home at one o'clock and watch the kickoff or even the pregame, if you will. Actually, JK, a perfect game is when I'm in the stadium. But even the Panthers were not that good. But tickets are still a little expensive. So a perfect Sunday, I'm in the living room in front of the TV. But I realize not every day I can be in the living room in front of the TV watching the game. So I mastered the craft of being able to just imagine a football field in my brain no matter anywhere I am. Like if I'm in the car, like if it's like I'm coming home from church, going to somebody's house, grabbing lunch with a friend, whatever it may be. I turn the, the game on the radio. I get the play-by-play -play announcer. And I just almost turn my windshield into a football field because it looks like a rectangle. So like the announcer will announce a play and I can visually see it happening on my windshield. Like, all right, hey, it was this player wearing this jersey. He went this far, now it's third down. Like I can visually make it happen in my brain. If I'm at a, an event, like a, a restaurant, maybe just uh, at a church event, whatever it may be, I'm gonna have it on my phone, 100%. Like I'll be that guy in the corner, like ducking, having the game on his phone. I'm either watching it live or I'll just get the play-by-play -play update. The play-by-play -play update, somebody just goes and types it in the computer, hey, this player did this, scored a touchdown. And I visually see it happen in my mind. Like I have mastered the craft, no matter what environment I'm in, no matter what location I'm in, I've mastered the craft of being able to be anywhere and almost connect my entire being to whatever the Panthers are doing that Sunday. Now, I say that because, not because I want you guys all to be Panther fans with me, but in the, the same way, we as Christians need to be able to be in one environment, wherever it may be, but have our, our, our mind, heart, and soul connected on something else. Like the same way I'm able to, to be anywhere, connect my mind, body, soul, spirit to the Panthers, no matter what environment I'm in. We as Christians, we need, to be, we need to be able to be in any environment at any time and still be able to be here on earth in this environment, but connect our mind and hearts on God. So it's almost like doing two things at one time, being in one physical location, but having your mind and heart set somewhere else. That's, that's the dream. That's the, the goal. But the, the problem is we can only, I, I think, this is just an assumption, we only connect our, our hearts and mind on Jesus, like uh, taking the Panther analogy for a second, if we were Panther fans in the stadium, like in the Panther stadium. Like to, to connect your, if we're all hypothetically Panther fans, to connect your mind, heart, and spirit to the Panthers, it'd be a lot easier to do that in the actual Panther stadium, right? Versus like Don Pedro's, a Mexican restaurant. Like it'd be much easier to connect your mind, body, and spirit to the Panthers when you're in the stadium, right? You got the scoreboard, the jumbotron, the game is happening live in front of you. Like it's so much easier to connect what you're feeling and thinking and believing when it's happening right in front of you. I think we take that train of thought and we apply it to our, our walk with Jesus as if, hey, I can only connect my mind and heart to Jesus when I'm actually there in heaven. Like when I get to heaven, it's going to be so much easier. Like being a Panther fan in this stadium, it's going to be so much easier because it'll be real. Right? It'll be tangible. I'll be right there. God's going to be right there. And then when I get there, I'll finally be able to, to truly, you know, set my heart on God and set my mind on God and let God have the attention of my heart and mind because it's right there in front of me. It would be easier though, right? It would be a lot easier to have our hearts and minds set on God when we're in heaven because it's happening right there in front of us. But I, I think that's a, a problem that we have is that we, we withdraw ourselves from setting our mind and heart on God because we're not physically in the stadium or in heaven with him.
So tonight, I just want to, I want to submit two things. I want to see, like, first, is it even possible, right? Is it even possible to be in one environment, to be here on earth, and is it even possible to, to be here but still connect our, our hearts and minds to God? Like, is it impossible to be in one environment constantly, uh, an earthly world, a fleshly world, sin everywhere you turn, and at the same time, while living here, look up and set our hearts and minds on the things of God? Like, is that even possible, so I want us to find out if it's even possible. And then I want us to know if it is possible, then does it even matter? Like if it is possible that we can set our hearts and minds on God while living here in a, an earthly world, does it even matter? Does it matter what has the attention of our hearts and minds? So tonight we're gonna answer those two things. If you just give me the, the next couple minutes of your time, I promise you'll leave here with the answers of those two things. So I want us to, we're gonna see two things tonight. We're gonna see that we will need to look up while living below. And we're going to see that when sin is dead, then there is freedom. But when you wound it, you're trapped. If you have no idea what that means, don't worry. We will discover it. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. If you're new with us or just kind of starting to track with us, we've been going through the book of Colossians. So we're now in, in chapter 3. Next week we're going to finish up the book of Colossians chapter 4. And we've been going through it verse by verse. It's only four chapters long, so to, uh, next week will be week 6. So we're going to be in the, the book of Colossians tonight and next week. And we're going to be in chapter 3 tonight starting in verse 1. And just some background info about the church in Colossians. Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae. Because they were, they were Christians, they were church just like us. They were being a attacked, if you will. A bunch of false teachers and false prophets, prophets trying to degrade who Jesus was and what he was about. Trying to say that Jesus did not resurrect. Trying to say that Jesus was misleading people. Like trying to just deter everybody with false, uh, false arguments that are not true. Trying to deceive people from following Jesus. So same way 2024, people are asking like, hey, is God even real? Like, no way, God's not real. No way God could come up from the grave. Like, dude, what are you talking about? It was just, he was just a prophet. Like, people just saying a bunch of stuff to try to deceive people from actually following what is true. So Paul is writing this letter to the church, to the Christians to remind them, hey, no, like Colossians chapter one, Jesus is the supreme God, that he is real. He is the image of the invisible God. Chapter two, he was like, watch out for false arguments. Like, watch out for the people who are going to say false things to get you off track. And this is where we're going to be at in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, since, so since what? Since you are a Christian, because you are a Christian, then you have been raised with Christ. Two weeks ago, Austin preached last week. Two weeks ago, we talked about being raised with Christ through the symbolism of baptism. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on earthly things. Things, verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, who is your identity, who fulfills your purpose, when Christ appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Well, uh, this is referring to the second coming of Jesus. So when Jesus comes back, we will also, if we are in Christ, we're going to appear with him in his full form of glory. That's amazing. But here from the, from the jump, we see a location of where our focus should be. Like Paul is writing in verses 1 and 2, and we have a, a location of where our minds and hearts should be. And that's the, the first point I want to submit to you, is that we need to look up while living below. And what I mean by that, look up while living below, is that we see this illustration of two locations. We have a above location and then a below location. In verse 1, he says, set your hearts on the things above. So we have a location, the things above. Then we get a description where Christ is, seating at the right hand of God. So he says, hey, take your heart and set it on the things above where Christ is, the right hand of God. Same thing with your mind. Set your mind on the things above. So we have a above location on what should have our attention. And just to kind of recap, Theology 101, Jesus, like for God so loved the world, so God's in heaven, now sends himself down in the form of his son. This is where Jesus comes into play. Jesus lives a perfect life for 33 years. He dies on the cross for my sins and your sins. He physically dies, gets buried in a tomb, comes back to life. After he walked out of the tomb, he's on the earth for 40 days and then ascends back into heaven. So now that he's seated at the right hand of God. So we have a, we have a location where our hearts and minds should be in heaven where Christ is, seated at the right hand 
of God. Now, it's not just the, the physical, geographical location of heaven. He says on the, on the things above, like there's some stuff attached to heaven, some things that are attached to where our hearts should be set above. So we have a above location. And some of the, the things that are above is pursuing the heart of Jesus and the character of God. Like if you can pursue the heart of Jesus and the character of God, like his righteousness, his grace, his compassion, his holiness, his justice, his purity, his guidance, how God views people, like setting our hearts and minds on the character of God and the heart of Jesus. Setting our hearts and minds on the things that are above. So we have a above location and then we have a, a below location. Anything that's underneath something that's above it is below it. And we get a description of, of where that is. In verse two, he says, set your minds on the things above. So something that would be below that, not on earthly things. So there's something, hey, look towards this, not this. Look towards the things above, not below earthly things. Don't let the focus of your mind and heart be on earthly things. But this is where it's very easy to be in this world and to set our minds and our hearts on what's around us because it's physically happening right in front of us. That, that's easy. But there, there's, a, there's a warning that we need to yield to. It would be, be a lot easier to focus your mind and heart on Jesus if we were in heaven. And it would be a lot easier to focus our minds and hearts as if we are above. We, we kind of went over that. But the Bible tells us so, some descriptions of heaven, which I think we get a misconception of. Right? Heaven is this, this perfect place, a, a place of no mores, no more pain, no more tears, no more death, no more temptation, no more sorrow, no more anything that is not good. Like heaven is the most perfect, perfect, perfect place you could ever imagine. We're just saying holy. So it would be a lot easier to set our minds above if we were above. It would be a lot easier to have our hearts and minds connected to heaven, the perfect place of no more pain and no more tears and no more sorrow, no more death, no more anxiety, no more depression, not one ounce of sin or temptation. It would be a lot easier to be connected with all that we have if we were above. It would be easier to look above if we were below, but the reality is we're below. Like the reality is we are right here on this earth. And I think the misconception we have is we're like, because I'm not in heaven and I don't physically see it right in front of me, I don't physically see God right in front of me. I can't set my mind and heart there. So now I'm going to set it to what's around me, the earthly things. So this means we need to look up while living below. And this is important because this is what separates Christians from the world. This is what separates a follower of Jesus from somebody who is not. Right? Just kind of kind of picture this. Like you're going out with your, you know, your guys or your girls. It was just payday, so you're feeling good. You got like $2 in the bank account. You're like, hey, let's go. I'm going to blow it all. Let me swipe the credit card max out. So you guys go out. You grab some food we can't afford. Then you guys start talking. The next thing you know, that talking turns into rumors. That rumors turns into gossip. And they're like, man, I can't believe Johnny would say that or Johnny would do that. Just making up Johnny. So there's a Johnny here. I'm sorry. But they're like, hey, I can't believe like Johnny would do that. And you're like, yeah, no freaking way. Johnny's a complete idiot. And now you start roasting Johnny when Johnny's not even there. Or, you know, you're, maybe you're, you're out with your friends, the vibes are still good, you just got paid. One person orders a shot and you're like, man, I, I got to fit in. I want to feel accepted. I don't want them to think I'm a weird Christian, so I got to fit in. I want to feel valued and seen. So I'll, now let me get a shot too. And then it turns into to one too many. Or just kind of one more example. Maybe you're, you're hanging out with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever. You make some eye contact. The tension's kind of, you know, in the air. You guys start touching, skin touching, you start kissing, then clothes start turning off, then hands start going to places, then boom, you just had sex, but sex outside of marriage. But that's looking below while living below, right? In, in those scenarios, like your mind and heart was not set on the things above, right? And when these moments when we're pressured, got big decisions to make, like, hey, man, should I give in to this? Should I not? Should I, should I fall into this sin? Should I not? Should I choose to sin or should I not? Like that's looking below while living below. And man, I, I, I get it, man. Like I could give us many examples with just the, the same repeating principle, looking below while living below. And that's just a, a nice way of saying you love the world and the things of this world. Right? If we have a above location and the below location on the earthly things, and we keep choosing 
to live in the below location and connecting our hearts and minds to this below location, that's just me, you know, presenting a nice way of saying you love the world and the things of this world. Like you're choosing to love the world and the flesh of this world rather than love God in those specific moments. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm not trying to, you know, make a, a big broad statement. I'm just saying in those moments, if you find yourself continuing to love the world when you have a choice to choose God, I'm waving the red flag. And, and Christians, man, in 2024 are the best at putting up a disguise. Christians in 2024, man, we can put up a disguise like nobody else, right? We can, we can say we're a Christian, take the Christian label, stamp it on yourself, put on this disguise of this outward appearance of, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I do these things, but it's all a disguise. It's fake. It's an outward Appearance, And you're just trying to, you know, make everybody else around you think that you're the, the famous Christian. You have your whole life together. You don't want people to think you don't have your life together. So you keep putting on this outward appearance, this Christian disguise. But you need to know that if this is you tonight and you are putting on a Christian disguise, you're only tricking yourself. I promise you the people around you that you think care probably don't. And you're only fooling yourself. And God sees right through it. He sees right through it. So if you're loving this world or the things of this world Yield this warning. This is 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. He says, look, if you love the world, then your love for God is not in you. Like if you're continuing to choose to look below while living below, I love the world and the things of this world. John is saying, look, you can't love God and love this world at the same time. And maybe you're just deceiving yourself, thinking you are. So I just want to ask you tonight, where is your mind and heart set on? Because if it's on the world and the things of this world, you can't have it set on God. You may be like, no, Josh, like, watch me. Like, I can do this. I can have my mind and heart set on God and the world. And I can play this game and go back and forth. I guarantee you, in the moments that you can give me an examples, you are falling into sin. Like, yeah, I can get drunk and love God at the same time. Sure, you're sinning and choosing to practice sin and loving the world. And I'm just yielding a warning that what the Bible says, say you can't love the world and God at the same time. It actually says that the love for the Father is not even in you to begin with. So don't let the Christian disguise fool you. And man, I get it. I get it, I get it. Like you've been told and you've been trained, almost trained, to, to don't be the friend that's lame or won't gossip or won't get drunk. So you want to fit in and be accepted and valued. So you've been trained and told that, hey, look, in order to be seen, valued, and accepted in your friend group, you got to do whatever they're doing. Start gossiping, start getting drunk. You don't want to be the, the, wor the weird boyfriend or girlfriend that won't satisfy the other person's sexual desires. And just about everybody in the planet is wrapped up in porn. So it's just another website. What's the harm in it? Like, I get it. And you have trained yourself, people have trained you, society has trained you to love the world. And man, I hear you, like, I, I get it. That's all we've seen, that's all we've heard. And that's what we've, we've been told, but God says, set your heart and mind on the things above, not below. He says that while we're here on earth, we gotta look up. We gotta continually connect our hearts and minds to God, to his character, to the heart of Jesus. So what has the attention of your mind and heart? God or the world? And see, this is lo looking up while living below. Another reason why this is important is because this is the greatest commandment Jesus gives us. Right, in the, the Old Testament. So back in Bible days, your Old Testament in the Bible, there's 613 laws that people had to obey to be holy. Like there's 613 laws they had to live out and do. Jesus comes into the scene and he wipes away all 613 of these laws and he fulfills them. And he gives us two commandments. Some Pharisees go to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, out of these 613, which one's the greatest? What's the greatest thing I could possibly do? And this is Jesus' response in Matthew 22, 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So when we connect our hearts and our minds to Jesus not only are we abiding in him, not only, not only are we choosing to love God over the world, we're fulfilling the first and greatest commandment Jesus gave us, to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And this will push you. 
This will push you and grow you. Like if, if you want a deeper faith, if you're like, man, I just keep going to church, to church, to church, nothing really pushes me and grows me. Like if you want to go deeper in your faith, leave here today and every single day of your life, just connect your mind and heart to Jesus. If you want to go deeper in your faith, just love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That will take you to greater depths than you probably have ever experienced, than I will ever experience. That if we go and live this out, Say, every time I have the choice to choose between loving the world or loving God, I'm going to continue to crucify my flesh, pick up my cross, and love God. That will take you to a deeper depth. But see how awesome this is, that you and I can be on this earth and have our heart and mind connected to God. Like the God of creation, the God of the mountains, the ocean, the God that will come back to life, the God of miracles, the God of healing, like the God of everything. You and I can connect our hearts and our minds to him. That's awesome. That, that There's not this big barrier and wall that I have to try to, you know, take a, a pickaxe to, to try to break down to, to get to God. But you and I right now in this moment, we can connect our mind and heart to the God of everything. I mean, that, that, that's awesome. So then it becomes like my thoughts start to align with God's thoughts and my ways start to align with God's ways and my desires start to align with God's desires. Same thing with you. Your thoughts will align with God's thoughts. Your desires will align with God's desires when you set your mind and heart on him. Your ways will turn into his ways. <laughs> the wisdom that he has will start to pour out over to you. The grace that he gives will start to pour out to you, to pour out to others because you're choosing to set your mind and heart on him. To, to have the love for the Father. And how do we do it? How do we look up while living below? How do we set our mind and hearts on Jesus? Going back to the, the football game. You can think of any team you want. Think of any stadium you want. Close your eyes real quick. You can think of a, a high school stadium, middle school, college, NFL, whatever it may be. But just picture a football field for a second. Like, like, like imagine sitting in the stadium right now. You can see the, the sideline markers. The, the orange cones, the yellow goalpost, the jumbotron, the announcers, you can smell the popcorn, you can hear the, the players, you can hear the referees whistle. Like, you guys all picture it in your mind? Give me a thumbs up if you picture it. There you go. You can open your eyes. That's how you do it. Like, that, that's how you set your mind. Like, you can control your thoughts. Like, you just prove to yourself that at any moment you can choose to think about a football field. So that means at any moment you can choose to set your mind and choose to think about what God thinks about. Like you can choose to set your mind on Christ. You just proved it to yourself right now that you can walk out here and at any moment tell your brain what to think. Like you guys can do this. Like we can do this. So we can leave here today. You know what? I'm going to choose to think about what God thinks about. That's how we set our mind on God, that you think about what he thinks about. And we can understand what he thinks about because he wrote a whole book. We have, we have his voice, we have his Bible, so now we know what God thinks about. So now we can set our minds and what God thinks about with our minds. So we can set our, our minds on him. We can read his word to know God's thoughts. His whole voice is filled throughout the scriptures. So we can set our minds on him and then for our heart. To, to set our hearts on him, pursue the presence of God. Not just go through a, a Bible checklist or a religious checklist, but pursue his presence. The presence of God. Read his word. Sit in moments of worship. So just take a moment to just be still and pray. To, to draw near to him. That you connect your heart to him. Look up while living below. Let, let's keep reading. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reread verses 1 through 4 so we can keep reading this in context. It says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This is where we're picking up, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Because of our sin, because of our earthly nature, God who is holy is going to send his wrath towards anything that is not aligned with this holiness. Right? And then verse 7, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. So just a, a reminder, Paul is writing this letter to, to a church, two Christians who had an old life and that way new life. And he's saying, hey, your old life, you used to walk in these ways, in this earthly nature. Verse 5, but when I read this. 
Rereading verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. If, you're, if I'm reading this right now and you just heard that, and you're like, man, that's not my old life. That's my life right now. And, and you're walking those ways right now of sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, money, idolatry, you fill in the blank. Like, that's your life right now, and you can't point to it to say that's my old ways. But there's a patterning develop. You need to know that the wrath of a holy God is coming. And, and for me, when I read verse 5, like, I rejoice. Like, when I read verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, and, and verse 7, that these are the ways you once walked, like, I can rejoice because verse 7 applies to me. I say this not in an arrogant way, but just as a testimony when it says you used to walk in these ways and the life you once lived, like I can for sure point to you like, hey, that's the life I definitely did live. Like the porn addiction I had in middle school and high school, like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil, like I definitely walked in that way, 100%. But now I can point back and look to the moment where I gave my life to Christ. I repented of those sins. I surrendered my life to him and he has freed me from him. So now I can walk back years later and point to that moment and say, hey, that was the life I once lived. But look what Jesus did now. That I can point back and say that was my life, but look what Jesus did now. Grace, redemption, freedom, and joy. So that, 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 that man, that, that fires me up because it, it does apply to me because I know my own story. But if you read this and you're like, hey, that's not my old life. Like I can't turn and point to that because it's my life right now. I'm just, I'm just submitting to you the, the, the warning in verse 6, the urgency to it that the wrath of God is coming. And the, the actionable thing that, that Paul instructs us to do with our earthly nature. He doesn't just say, sit there and stare at it, sit there and cry over it, sit there and feel bad, sit there and feel guilty. He gives us an action item of things to do with our earthly nature. So this is you right now, and you can't point to and say, hey, that was me, because it's me right now. I'm submitting to you the same thing the Bible says of what Paul says to do, what God says to do. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. He, said, he says, put it to death. And this is my second point. When sin is dead, there is freedom. When it's wounded, you are trapped. And when Paul writes, put it to death. When sin is dead, then there is freedom. When you just wound it, then you're trapped. Like we, like to, we like to wound our sin and not put it to death. We wound our sin. Like we look below while living Below, we like to love the world and just you know sweep the sin under the rug and just wound it a little bit, a, wound it a little bit, and then we make promises like, okay, God, I promise this is the last time, and then I feel bad just for a little bit. I'm gonna set these boundaries just to break them again, and we just keep sweeping sin under the rug or self-justifying things because of God's grace, but we gotta put it to death because that's where freedom is. If it's dead, it can't be revived. If it's wounded, it can be. Revive. I know you think like death and freedom, two things that go together but sound like they shouldn't, right? But think about it. If loving the world instead of God, like if I take a, uh, uh, you know, you can look at whatever sin you want. If I just take a, a porn uh, addiction, if you will, relating to my testimony, and instead of wounding it, say, all right, you know, slap on the wrist. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I made it 24 hours. I'm not going to do it for 24 hours. Like, let's go. You just wound it a little bit. You know, delete your search history just to come back to it a week later. And you just wound it a little bit. What if you just put it to death? Like it's not alive anymore. Like what if you just said, hey, look, I'm just going to put this thing to death. Which means it's not alive. No more heartbeat, not breathing. This addiction no longer exists because it's dead, not wounded. And you never look at porn again. Like that's where freedom is. Like when it's dead and you put it to death, then you walk out in freedom because it's dead. So when he says put it to death, he's like, hey, if you want freedom from it, put it to death. Stop feeding it, but starve it. Starve your flesh. Put it to death. And the, the urgency attached to putting it to death, we see in verse 6, is it says, because of these things, because of your earthly nature, the wrath of God is coming. His holy wrath is coming. And there will be a day where we all stand before God. The ultimate statistic is this. Either Jesus will come back first or we're going to die first. One of those things is 100% going to happen. You, you and I will either, death is the ultimate statistic. You live long enough, you die. Like either Jesus is going to come back first or you and I will die first. And all of us are going to stand face to face with a holy God. That yes, he is love. Yes, he is graceful. Yes, he is merciful. But he's holy. 
And he has to keep that standard of holiness. And anyone who has not repented of their sins from their heart, turned away from their earthly nature, and acknowledged Jesus as the Lord of their life, will fully receive the wrath of God. But when sin is dead, there is freedom. When it's wounded, you're trapped. Many of us tonight are probably trapped. Anxious thoughts, thoughts of depression, addictions, stuff you don't want to tell anybody. You just feel trapped. Like you're in a jail cell and you just, there's no light, there's no tunnel, there's no way out. Man, there is a way out. 100%. Don't let Satan deceive you. Like you can walk out in freedom. There is a way out. And it's putting it to death, going to the cross of Jesus. So there's physical freedom from addictions, but there's also a spiritual freedom. Like when you, when you put sin to death, there is a, a spiritual freedom from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says this, for God did not appoint us to his wrath. Like God did not say, all right, humanity, here three strands, here's my wrath, go walk towards it. No, he's like, hey, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Like God has given us this warning, hey, my wrath is coming towards these things. It's not my desire you walk towards it, but my desire is that you obtain salvation. You repent of your sins. You acknowledge Jesus as the Lord of your life. And you become a new creation. And man, you are redeemed, born again, every sin wiped away, walking out in freedom, spiritually and physically, a spiritual new life of, uh, of newness. That's where freedom is. Let's keep reading here. And here Paul switches gears. All right, he, he starts off almost giving the gospel. Like, hey, set your minds on this, your hearts on this, put this stuff to death, repent of your sins. It's almost a, a gospel message. And then he switched gears to say, hey, this is what you do now. Like, hey, after you've set your mind and heart on Jesus, after you put to death your earthly, earthly nature, after you repented of your sins and acknowledged Jesus as the Lord of your life and you are following him, start doing this. And that's where we pick up in verse 8. It's almost like a, hey, start doing this after you've done everything, verses 1 through 7 say. Verse 8 says, but now you must also rid yourself of all such th things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Your old life with the things you used to do. Like if you are a, a Christian who is... Before Jesus, you have an old life. And there were things that you did, you dabbled in sin, then you became a new creation. So he says your old life and the things that you practice. So some of us today, right now, may have a disguise on and you're in your old life still practicing these things. Don't lie to each other, don't lie to yourself. And this, uh, this also, verse 8 and 9, alludes to being sanctified. The word sanctified means to be made holy. So while we're here on earth... If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you are being made holy. Like sin, it's just the Holy Spirit is getting the sin out of your life. You're becoming closer to, to Jesus, to be made like Jesus. You're becoming holy. Like you're almost in a, a Jesus crock pot until Jesus comes back. Like just, just in, the, in the crock pot brewing, sin getting, getting taken out, becoming made more like Jesus. This long-term goal of being made holy. So it's not just check off a salvation box and move on with your life. But he's like, okay, hey, you put your sin to death. Now you, you accepted Jesus. Let's keep moving forward to be sanctified. Rid yourself of anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language. Don't lie to each other. Like he keeps it going. Like, hey, guys, we got to keep moving forward. We can't just stop here after receiving Jesus. We got to keep moving forward. Verse 10, and have put on the new self. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. So right now, if you're, if, if you're like, man, that, that verse 5, that earthly nature, it's, it's applying to me. Like I can't point back to my old life and say, hey, that used to be me because it's me right now. And the wrath of God is coming. And I don't know what to do. And I have this sin and I want to be free. But I, at the same time, I love the world. But I can't love the world and God at the same time. So I got to pick one. Like, yes, you do. You have to pick one. But know the beautiful side of the gospel is that when you choose Jesus, you're a new creation. Like God no longer looks at you in your old ways and the old sin but he sees you as his son. He sees you as his daughter. Beautiful, redeemed, covered by his grace. And then you can walk out in joy because you're a new creation. So now have put on the new self, which is being renewed. That word renewed means reestablished and the knowledge in the image of its 
creator. If you're with us, Colossians chapter 1, we know that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So verse 10 saying, hey, in your new self, you're being reestablished in the knowledge of Jesus. Like we, we are being sanctified. We're being reestablished. How cool is that? That every time I, I set my mind and heart on Jesus, I'm being renewed. I'm being reestablished in Jesus. Like that's awesome. I get, it goes back full circle. When I set my mind and heart on him, I put this stuff to death. I don't just check off the salvation box and, and stand still, but I keep moving forward. I set my mind on him. I'm going to keep being reestablished and drawn near to Jesus to be made more like Jesus. That's awesome. Like that, that, that's, that's good news, man. That, that's, that's encouraging. That's amazing. The more you set your mind and heart on Jesus, you're being renewed in Jesus, reestablished in Jesus. Verse 11, here in the new self, in the body of Christ, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Like, hey, once you're a Christian and you join the body of Christ, we're all, at this, we're all in the same playing field. There, there's, no, there's no discrimination, there's no race, there's no, hey, this people group and this people group, but we're all equal at the cross when we come to Jesus and we're in this beautiful, beautiful family, which is amazing. Verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, anybody who desires to repent of their sins and follow Jesus is his chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So he keeps going like, hey, we got to keep moving the ball forward. Like, hey, because you are a Christian, you put on this new self. Don't stop here, but let's keep moving forward. Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. And if any of you has any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So to, to summarize all this, that we need to look up while living below. But if right here you are looking below while living below, like you are loving the world and the things of this world and the love for the Father is not in you. Man, the, the yield I would give you, the warning I would give you, give you is that the wrath of God is coming. And the, the, the reality is the wrath is coming to, the wrath of God is coming to all of us. For those who are covered in the blood of Jesus, God says, hey, that's my son, that's my daughter. Welcome to the family. But if you're not his son, if you're not his daughter, the wrath of God is coming. Man, and that should frighten us. That should give us an honest moment to, to evaluate. And when sin is dead, there is freedom. When it's wounded, you're trapped, put to death your earthly nature to experience the physical freedom and also the spiritual freedom. That if you're walking in the ways of this world, you're living a spiritual death. The urgency is, is that Jesus is coming back like he could come back tomorrow or we're gonna die first. Like we never know, like our days are numbered. I'm not trying to like be drastic here, but I could seriously leave here tonight and get in a car wreck and I could be dead tonight. Like I, I'm not trying to be drastic, just honest. Like man, or some drunk driver hits me and now I died tonight. Like. But I have confidence in knowing that if that happened, I know where my eternity is going to be. And we, we don't know. So there is a spiritual death and there is some urgency that Jesus is coming. So to, going back to that question, can we live on this earth and have our hearts and minds set on Jesus? Yes, 100%. But the first step in doing so is to be brutally honest with yourself. Asking yourself if you have truly repented of your sins, acknowledge Jesus as the Lord of your life. Like that's the first step to, to setting your heart and mind on Christ, that you got to be with Christ first. And you got to be brutally honest with yourself. Not like, not, not, you know, you got to look right through the Christian disguise that you may put up. And you got to be honest with yourself. If you don't know, then ask him, God, where do I stand with you? You know, a, a, a good evaluation question would be answer this. If you were face to face with God and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? Is it because your heart and mind is set on him and you have repented of your sins and you're his son and his daughter and you're following him? Or is it because I was a good person? Because I showed up to church. Because good people make it into heaven. If it's any of those things, except that, hey, I've repented of my sins and because Jesus died on the cross, I don't deserve it, but I'm able to go into heaven. That's not gonna end well. So you got to be brutally honest with yourself. My goal is not to shame you or judge you, but to love you enough to tell you the truth. And then after you're brutally honest with yourself, 
Maybe you haven't putting up a Christian disguise. Know that God knows your heart. He knows where you stand, where your heart stands, either loving him or loving the world. And tonight you have an opportunity to change your life. Tonight, if you are here, you have an opportunity to change your life. Like physically tonight, you could walk out in freedom. If there's some addictions, if there's some sin, that you can change your life by walking out here tonight free. That this shame you may be carrying, you can walk out with it. This depression you may be carrying, you can walk out with peace. This anxiety you may be carrying, you can walk out with some joy. Like physically tonight, your life could change. And also spiritually. But you have an opportunity tonight for your spiritual life to change. That if right now, if you can't point to your old life to say, hey, that was me. But look at me now because it's you right now and you're walking in the ways of this world. You have an opportunity to, to give yourself spiritual freedom. To be renewed in the image of Jesus. To be born again. Only thing you have to do that Jesus says, we confess with our mouth that he is Lord. Acknowledge him as the Lord of your life. Repent of your sins. And follow him. Turn your back to the world so you can have the love of the Father. That if you just repent of your sins. Acknowledge him as the Lord of your life. Like you are spiritually renewed. Forgiven. Covered by his grace. So tonight you have an opportunity to change your life. As we close, we're going to worship one more time. And at the same time, I want to invite uh, all of our leaders. And kind of our prayer team. So we're going we're gonna to close by worshiping. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to either be prayed for, to talk through something, you know, whatever it may be. And if tonight you want to take advantage of that opportunity, if you're like, hey, I want my life to change tonight. I want to go from death to life. Tonight you have that opportunity.